myself thought we would open the meeting with a prayer, which I did. And I pray for the President of the United States. Uh, but I told him about Solomon, King Solomon, when he became, when he was to become king of the Jews. He, he, um, he prayed to God. He said, how can I ever follow King David? King David, King of the Jews, uh, I need you to give me great understanding and wisdom, Lord. And uh, after he prayed and prayed and prayed, God came to him and said, Solomon, because you did not ask for longevity, great wealth, or um, vengeance against your enemies, I will give you more wisdom than anyone has ever had, the wisdom of Solomon. I was raised in a way that is full, a heart full of love and always prayed for the president. And I still pray for the president. I pray for the president all the time. And we spent a lot of time in church as children and as teenagers. You know, I was raised to believe that actions spoke louder than words. And if you were a person of faith, that should be evident in how you treated other people and what kind of life you lived. But we should not cede an inch on these moral and ethical and humanitarian issues that are rooted in what our faith tells us is right. I have said many times that, you know, I am a praying person and if I hadn't been uh, during the time I was in the White House, I would have become one. I pray on a pretty regular basis during the day because I need that strength and I need that support. I have a very special old Bible. Most importantly, I brought my Bible. We all in this room I know and we know many millions more everywhere turn to God in prayer. What carried us through was a willingness to seek power and protection from one much greater than ourselves, to turn back to him and to trust in his mercy. Without his help, America will not go forward. If we drop to our knees on occasion, we will acknowledge that we never fully know God's purpose. To do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God. And my first act as president is a prayer and I ask you to bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and thank you for your love. Let's bow our heads for just for a closing prayer. Oh, Father, we are grateful for the blessings that you've given to us. I would not be running for president of the United States if I did not have very strong religious and spiritual uh, feelings. We believe that the Almighty hears our prayers and answers those who seek him. That's what we believe. Uh, I was up rather late last night thinking about and praying about what I ought to say today. I believe that to be forgiven more than sorrow is required. At least two more things. First, genuine repentance. I've been a practicing Catholic my whole life. Um, and uh, it has particularly informed my social doctor. Now, exploring a run for the White House, he told CNN's Van Jones his faith and family keep him grounded. Have you noticed that politicians around election time start talking about God and their faith and the Bible and prayer? Doesn't it actually kind of bothers me? <laughs> Why do they do that? Probably to get like a little bit under your skin that they're with God as well. So maybe you can understand them a little bit better. Honestly, I think they're pandering to people that have these really strong beliefs. And even though I'm not somebody who has these kind of strong religious beliefs behind me, I really think that a lot of time they're just trying to, like, let's try to hook in as many people as possible. Yeah, get votes. Because people think, oh, he believes in God. He must be a good man. <laughs> you know, Hitler did the same thing. Did you know that? Yes, he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he talked about God and he kissed babies. And that's what politicians do. And... They actually deceive the hearts of the simple. That's the biblical phrase for it. And yet it's hard to reconcile because some of these politicians stand for everything that the Bible's against. Hillary is saying in the ninth month, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb of the mother just prior to the birth of the baby. Now, you can say that that's okay, and Hillary can say that that's okay, but it's not okay with me. Hillary Clinton supports unlimited abortion on demand 
up until the moment of delivery, partial birth, with taxpayer funding and no parental notification. What do you think about the president calling on a ban on late-term abortions? It's really quite a sad thing. The Roe v. Wade is um, clear as to three trimesters. Because I've been fighting this fight for decades in the Congress, uh, the, the fight of a woman's right to choose. And if elected president, I will do everything that I can to allow women to make that choice and have access to clinics all over this country so that if they choose to have an abortion, they will be able to do so. I support a woman's right to choose. I support it's a constitutional right. I've supported it. I will continue to support it. So how could that be? How could someone believe in God and have standards that oppose what the Bible says God has? Um, I just think it's the way that everybody views it, you know, themselves. Uh, in my opinion, I don't think it's right. But just because politicians think um, they think that they have enough knowledge, they could just throw in the God card, and they think it's okay. But in my opinion, I don't think that's we shouldn't play that card. Uh, well, do you know what the card is actually called? No, I don't. It's called idolatry. Have you ever heard of that word? I have before. But what does it mean? Uh, I'm not sure. I, would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, it's a violation of the first and the second of the Ten Commandments. It's where you make up your own God. Small g. First commandment says you shall have no other gods before me. The second says you shall not make yourself a graven image of any likeness of anything on the earth, under the earth, in the sea, or in the heavens. Don't make a god to suit yourself. And Of course, we don't make gods with our hands nowadays, like those little idols, but we make a god in our mind. We create a god in our own image, a god that doesn't exist, a figment of our imagination, the place of imagery, and that's what politicians do. They say, oh, I pray, I read the Bible, I believe in God, and they stand for things that are an abomination to God. So you teach psychology at the school? Uh, yes, I do. Do you believe in God's existence? Personally, no. As an atheist, do you really believe the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything? I believe that's what we currently have the best evidence for. That nothing created everything? It wasn't really nothing. It was just a hyper-concentrated point of matter that essentially was so small it was nothing to us. Um, but that's the matter. It's, you've got to have a, a cause of matter. I mean, how did the matter get there? I mean, that's what matters. You know, you look at the, to have a Big Bang, you've got to have materials, and no Big Bang creates order, always creates chaos, always. So I'm going to try and give you scientific evidence for God's existence. Are you open to it? Are you reasonable? Probably. Okay, when you look at a building, is there any proof there was a builder? <laughs> um, not... Okay, so yes, there's proof that there was a builder. But... The building is proof there's a builder. Couldn't want better scientific proof than to have the building as evidence because buildings can't build themselves. Yep. Every building is proof of a builder. Every painting is proof of a painter. Paintings can't paint themselves. And creation is proof of a creator. Flowers and birds and trees and sun, moon, stars, puppies and kittens and love and laughter and all these wonderful things that surround us show us the creative hand of God. Does that make sense, what I just said? It does. I've heard similar lines before. Do you think God always hears prayer? Um, yes, I do. I do believe God always listens. Do you know the Bible doesn't say that? Uh, I'm not sure. I've never read it before. Yeah, let me tell you what it says. It says, Your sins have made a separation between you and your God, so that He will not hear. It says, If I have sin in my heart, God will not hear me. The Bible says the prayer of the wicked is an abomination to God. There's only one way you can have God hear your prayer, and that's by coming to Him with a humble heart. I've always told since like little that you can always talk to God, that He'll always listen, but I've never heard that. Yeah, you can always talk to God, but He's not going to always listen, and it's very important to make sure you've got His ear, because you could be hanging by your fingers over a cliff and crying out to God, and if He's not going to hear you, you're in big trouble. So, so here's a question for you. Do you think God is happy with you or angry at you? Supposing... So, making the supposition that there is a God, I don't think that God is particularly angry. I don't think that God is particularly happy. I think God is just kind of, like, if there is, if we're entering into that space, the best kind of explanation I could give is that God is just watching. I don't know necessarily that, again, if there is a God, that's what is going on, but like that's, I don't see that direct intervention on a day-to-day -day basis. That's understandable. I mean, God let Nazi Germany happen. There's a lot of things in history that God's let happen, and they're evil, and he didn't do anything about them. Yet. 
A lot of rats ran our chicken coop, so we got some rat poison and we just tossed it around different places, right in the back of our garden where the dog wouldn't get it. My wife looked out the window the other night and saw the dog eating rat food. And so she ran out and she screamed, drop it, and reached to his mouth to pull it out. You know what he did to her? I'm assuming he probably snarled. He snarled and tried to bite her because he didn't realize she was trying to do something good for him. He didn't die. He didn't swallow it. So that was great. So, Trevor, I think you're in terrible danger. You're eating rat food. And I want to tell you about it, but I don't want you to bite me. Do you believe you're in great danger? Personally, no. Yeah, if you are and I'm able to convince you of it, I'm doing you a great favor. So are you doing anything that could displease God? Uh, pray every night. Talk yeah? To yeah. Are you doing anything that could displease him? Because remember, politicians pray regularly. Uh, I don't think so, no. Are you familiar with criminal law? Criminal law, a little bit, yes. Do you know what the word intent means? Intent? Intent. Uh, a little bit, yeah. It means that if uh, a prosecutor believes you had intent to commit a crime, he'll prosecute you. If there's no intent, he can't prosecute you. And by that I mean, if a man drives his car into a crowd of people and kills them, Intentionally did it. If he intentionally did it, had intent, then he's guilty and he's guilty of murder. But if his brakes failed, there was no intent and he can't be charged with murder. So I'm going to put you on the stand. I'm going to be your prosecutor and see if there's intent there when it comes to your crimes against God. Can you handle that? Uh, I think so. Can you be honest with me? Yes, I'll try to be honest. Let me see if I can convince you you're in danger. Do you think you're a good person? I try to be. How many lies have you told in your life? Mmm, that's probably too high of a number to realistically count. Lots of those lies are like, oh, you look great today, but... Well, that's discretion. You don't want to be beaten up by your wife. (laughs) So so what do you call someone who tells lies? A liar. So what are you? I guess I'm a liar. Have you heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Yes, I have. Can you explain it to me? Basically, it's the idea that people who think they know what they're doing do or tend to underperform or tend to not do as well as what they could actually do if they knew a little bit more. Yeah, I was like that when I was 13. I thought I could sing like Elvis and I played, I sung into a tape recorder and it was horrific when I played it back. (laughs) We tend to overestimate how we are, especially morally. You know, Dunning Kruger didn't go into the moral aspect, but we think we're better than what we are. How many lies have you told in your life? Oof, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Quite a few? Quite a few, yeah. So what do you call someone who tells lies? A liar. (laughs) So what are you? I'm a liar. Have you ever stolen something? Yes. What do you call someone who steals? Stealer. A thief. A thief. So what are you? I'm a thief. No, you're not. You're a lying thief. I'm a lying thief. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Oh, definitely. I'm sure. Usually it's in a moment of frustration. Um, When you ask if I've used God's name in vain, do you just mean, like, using the term God plus something else? No, just using it in frustration or anger where you want to express disgust. You want to use a filth word beginning with S. Or you use his name in its place, which is very serious, and none of us use our mother's name like that because it would be disrespectful. But we're so at enmity with God, we hate him without cause, the Bible says, that we use his name as a cuss word, which is called blasphemy, very serious in his eyes. One to go, and I appreciate your honesty, Trevor. Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Um, not particularly. Um, Have you looked at pornography? Uh, at some point in my life. Yeah, well, that's lust. Yeah, sure. You had sex before marriage? Um, yes, I don't really think that's an issue, personally. Yeah, true. So, Trevor, I'm not judging you, but you've just told me you're a lying, blasphemous, (laughs) fornicating, adulterer at heart, and you have to face God on Judgment Day, and he gave you a conscience so you know right from wrong. Conscience is God-given, but society-shaped. Here's the big question. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day... You're going to be innocent or guilty? Um, I would say guilty. Heaven or hell? I would say heaven. Where? Heaven. Why? Because he forgives everybody. Are you sure about that? Positive. Do you know what you've just done? You've violated the first and the second of the Ten Commandments by making up your own image of God. The Bible doesn't say he forgives everybody. I'm sure he would if I were to talk to him and tell him how I feel. Bible says your prayer is an abomination to God. So what can you do to be saved? How can you be made right with God? Have you any idea? Um, confess. No, that'll get you more trouble. It's like saying to a judge, I confess I committed the crime. He's going to say, good, we've got, um, a, conf- say we've got a confession out of you. You're going to jail. So what can you do? Stop sinning and... 
try that in a court of law. I've been robbing banks, um, uh, judge, but I'm going to stop. He said, oh, good for you. You're going to jail. So yeah. that's not going to help. So you know what you do if all the evidence is in in a court case yes. and, you, and you cannot justify yourself? What should you do? Um, I will know. I would like you to tell me. I would like to find out. You throw yourself on the mercy of the court. That's what you do. You say, I'm guilty. I, I place myself in your mercy, judge. And the Bible says God is rich in mercy to all that call upon him. Now tell me, you've had a Christian background. Mm -hmm. How is it that God can show you and I, guilty criminals in his eyes, mercy? How can he give us mercy? Um, Probably considered guilty. Uh, Heaven or hell? Uh, good question. My understanding of the Christian faith specifically is that the entire point of the sacrifice on the cross was that we were essentially redeemed for some of the things that we had done and maybe uh, not forgiven entirely, but given kind of that second chance or the benefit of the doubt. Yes and no. Let me, if I may, correct your theology. Um, if you die in your sins, you've got God's promise, you'll end up in hell, it'll give you justice. Uh, death is evidence that God is angry at sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We get death as wages from God for our crimes against his law. Like a judge will give a criminal the electric chair because he slaughtered three young girls after he raped them. He says, you've earned this. This is what you deserve. This is your wages. And God's given us death as wages for our sin. It's that serious in his eyes. Death is actually the arresting officer that will drag us before the judge of the universe to stand trial on judgment day and hell is God's prison and there's no parole and the thought of you going there horrifies me. I love you, I care about you and I, the, any, the thought of any human being ending up getting justice on judgment day really takes my breath away. Eric, the reason God can show you mercy is because Jesus suffered and died on the cross. Now you know that but you probably don't understand it. So let me just share something with you and get your thoughts. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law, Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on the cross. That's why he said, it is finished just before he died, which is a weird thing to say when you're dying, it is finished, unless you're the son of God, yeah, paying the fine for the law that you and I violated. If you're in court, even though you're guilty, if someone pays your fine, a judge can let you go. He can say, Trevor, this is very serious. There's a stack of speeding fines here, but someone's paid him, you're free to go. And he can do that, which is legal and right and just. Even though you're guilty, you can walk. And you and I can walk on judgment day. We can avoid the damnation of hell. The death sentence can be taken off us. And God can legally grant us everlasting life, let us live, all because of the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. What we have to do in response is very simple. A child can understand it. Repent, that is confess and forsake your sins. If you become a Christian, you don't want to say I'm a Christian, but continue to do things you know are morally wrong because that's playing the hypocrite and just deceiving yourself. If I put you on the edge of a thousand foot cliff with your toes over the edge, jagged rocks below you, you could feel the stones crumbling beneath your feet, would that be fearful? Probably. Probably, it'd be terrifying, it'd be horrible. Would the fear be a good feeling or a bad feeling? Generally, it's considered negative, so... Yeah, it'd be negative, it'd be bad. Would the fear itself be good or bad? Neutral. No, would it be good? Because it's telling you to move back from the cliff. It's your protector. It's not your enemy, it's your friend. It's saying, get back, get back. You're in danger. And Trevor, what I've tried to do because I love you, I care about you, is put your toes over the edges of eternity and let fear fill your heart, because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God gives you justice. It's a horrifying thing. But I'm hoping you'll see that fear horrible though the feeling is that it's your friend not your enemy because it wants to preserve you it wants to get that rat poison out of your mouth and so don't bite don't bite me don't bite God don't bite the message just think about your eternity think about how precious your eyes are and how much more your life is worth that looks out those windows think about the beauty of creation and how God has lavished his kindness upon you and yet you have despised his kindness and used his name as a cuss word and yet he's still willing to forgive you because he's the lover of your soul and think of the words of jesus where he said what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul eric you're like a man on the edge of a plane he's ten thousand feet up he knows he has to jump he doesn't have a parachute on and this is his plan he's going to flap his arms and try and save himself <laughs> yeah. and i'd say to that man don't try and save yourself it's not going to work trust the parachute so don't trust your goodness to save you. You don't have any. You're like the rest of us. You've got a multitude of sins. Transfer your trust from yourself to the Savior. And the minute you do that, God will give you a new heart with new desires so you love that which is right. The moment you're loving that which is wrong, 
you're loving your porn and your fornication and all things that you know are wrong, mm-hmm. and they do give pleasure, yeah. but God will change your heart so you love righteousness. It's called being born again, where God takes your heart and causes you to walk in his statutes. That's how the Bible puts it. And then on top of that, not only will he change your heart, but he'll grant you everlasting life as a free gift, and you have, you've got God's promise on it, and you cannot lie because he's without sin. Is this making sense? Yes, it does. You're going to think about this? Um, yeah, the way that I view God more. So will you think about what we talked about today? I'll definitely give it some consideration. Because yeah, if you were going to die tonight, you'd probably move from consideration to, I'll give this serious thought. This is my life, my precious life. So I'd be honored if you would uh, think of it with that sense of urgency, that you could die in your sleep tonight and how precious your life is and, and you want to preserve it. Thanks, it's been interesting. When the camera was turned off, I asked Trevor if he had suicidal thoughts. He said that he had in the past, so I gave him our booklet, You're Not Alone, and Save Yourself Some Pain. Then he said, This has been very interesting. Please pray for Trevor. Well, you need to repent and trust Christ. I will. When are you going to do that? Starting now. Starting now? Right now. May I pray with you? Yes, sir. Father, I pray for Eric. Thank you for his open heart and his desire to get right with you. Now here's something that'll help you grow in your faith. Read the Word daily using this amazing one-year devotional, Jesus in Red. For more than 48 years, I've read the Bible every day without fail. I thought every Christian did that, but sadly, many don't. So get into a habit you'll never regret by reading the Word daily using this beautiful little devotional. 365 readings based solely on the words of Jesus. There's nothing like it. Get it through Amazon, livingwaters.com, or at your bookstore.